I'm going to give it just one more minute and then we are going to start the lecture. Thank you for those who put their information in. Again, you're welcome to do that. And also, please take a look at our slide uh, for a couple of notes, which I'll go over in a moment as well. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. So welcome. Thank you for joining us. You are now joining Unit 3B, Session 2 of the ACES Aware of Ventura County Virtual Lecture Series. We are recording, as I said, this um, lecture, so you'll be able to access it on the ACES Aware of Ventura County website after tonight. As we noted in the chat box, all in attendance will be entered into a drawing for custom ACES Aware of Ventura County prize, and we will announce the drawing winner in our session follow-up email. So look out for that email from ACES Aware Ventura County. In your registration and evaluation, please make sure you note whether you are requesting continuing education. And for those of you who are seeking CE units, you must be present for the entirety of the session and complete the evaluation to receive those credits. My name is Sharon Elmenstorp. I was formerly with First Five Ventura County Help Me Grow, which is when I was a part of the ACE Aware Ventura County team and working on uh, with the, this team on some of these lectures. So we're very excited that this is happening in Ventura County. Before we begin, we'll hear a few words from Dr. Landon. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this session that is part of the AAVC Provider Training Lecture Series. We hope this session is both informative and engaging for you. Don't forget to register and complete the evaluation so we know who our audience is and how to improve in the future. All who register, including those who are watching this as a recording, will be entered into a raffle for a special ACES Aware of Ventura County Prize. This lecture is being recorded so you can have access to it on our website at any time. Thank you for joining us on our mission to bring better help, better health, and better hope to Ventura County and beyond. So our speakers today, we're very lucky to have back with us tonight, Dr. Danielle Shaw and Judith Druin. They will be presenting on trauma imposters of behavioral and physical pediatric presentations. Dr. Danielle Shaw, is a native Californian who completed her education in California public schools. After graduating from medical school at UC Irvine in 1993, she then completed her training in pediatrics there in 1996. She subsequently moved to Ventura County where she worked for two medical groups prior to opening her solo pediatric practice in 2004. In 2013, after a medical mission trip to Africa, Dr. Shaw closed her pediatric practice to train in general and child and adolescent psychiatry in Augusta, Georgia. In 2017, after she graduated, um, she traveled and took and passed her psychiatry board examination in Paris before circumnavigating the globe. Dr. Shaw has also been the staff psychiatrist for Casa Pacifica Center for Children and Families. She founded a local pediatric mental health collaborative to bring pediatricians together with local mental health professionals. She is also on the American Academy of Pediatrics California Chapter 2 ACES Committee. Dr. Shah remains involved in the local medical community. She also enjoys ballroom dancing, hiking, gardening, and would love to someday return to horseback riding. Judith Druin earned a master's in marriage, family, and child counseling from California State University, Northridge, and her BS in child development from California State University, Fresno. She is a graduate of the Infant Parent Mental Health Postgraduate Certificate Program in Napa, California, University of Massachusetts, Boston. She has earned phase one and phase two, which is training the trainer, certificates from the Child Trauma Academy Certificate Program with Dr. Bruce Perry, the Neurosequential Model Network. She has held a license in marriage and family therapy since 2005 and has 15 years of experience as a preschool director. She is currently in private practice as a licensed marriage and family therapist, focusing on parent-child relationships and children who have experienced trauma. She works for the California Inclusion and Behavior Consultation Network, providing direct services to preschool staff who have children with challenging behaviors. And most recently, she earned a certificate in conflict resolution through Ventura Conflict Resolution Institute. Through her small business, along with providing private counseling, she provides training for those who work with children, is a conference speaker, and offers mediation services for a variety of clients. So after the lecture, Judith and Danielle will be responding to your questions. You're all encouraged to submit your questions via the chat box for our speakers to answer during the Q&A session. And with that, I'll turn it over to our presentation. Well, 
Okay, thank you for that introduction. I'm Dr. Danielle Shaw and... I'm Judith Duren. And um, today we're talking about trauma and postures of behavioral and physical pediatric presentation. So hopefully this will be really practical for you. But before we get started, I wanted to let you know that we created a handout to summarize some of the tables and resources. It can be kind of overwhelming to see in the presentation, and you may want to keep those handy as a reference for your clinical practice. So welcome everyone again. I'm just really excited to have this opportunity to share this information with you. It really affects, has affected my life personally, and I want to help pediatricians recognize behavioral and physical symptoms of trauma that they may see in their practices. You see, I practice pedi pediatrics as a primary care pediatrician for about 20 years before training in child and adolescent psychiatry. In pediatrics, I felt unprepared to address the mental health needs of my patients, and maybe some of you experienced that too. And then, personally, I struggled to find mental health services for my own daughter, whom I adopted at birth. You see, I later found out that her birth mother had experienced childhood trauma and used substances during her pregnancy. Becoming her mommy that day that she was born did not protect her from the effects of generational and prenatal adversity. So I want to share some insights that I've learned with my combined personal, pediatric, and psychiatric experiences. So I hope this presentation leads to some aha moments for you, as my journey has for me. So the learning objectives for this presentation on trauma and postures actually includes the previous presentation on the developmental and relational paradigm when considering ACEs. And there are also some learning objectives which are common to all presentations in this series. And those are objectives number one and two. And then um, for this particular lecture, the learning objective is to name three physical or behavioral presentations of health conditions, otherwise known as ACE-associated health conditions, that may appear in clinical practice, which could include toxic stress as part of their differential diagnosis. In the following slides, I will define these terms so that we'll be speaking the same language during the presentation. For trauma, we'll use that kind of interchangeably with maltreatment. And then abuse, that's acts of commission as opposed to neglect, which are acts of omission. Then there's the toxic stress response, which I have learned so much about. And then we'll learn about risk factors for the toxic stress response, which includes adverse childhood expense experiences, ACEs, and also social determinants of health, among other things. So here is the definition of trauma according to the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Trauma results from an event, a series of events, or set of circumstances that is experienced by an individual as physically, emotionally harmful or threatening that has lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning and physical, social, emotional, or spiritual well-being. That's a lot. And trauma doesn't discriminate. It can impact every single one of us, and it can impact individuals, families, groups, communities. Per the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, 5th edition, that's referred to as the DSM-5 in psychiatry. It's kind of like um, Nelson's textbook of pediatrics for the pediatric practitioner. So they define child abuse as an act of commission perpetrated on a minor child, and it's divided into three types. Physical which is non-accidental physical injury to a child, makes sense. Sexual, any sexual act involving a child that is intended to provide sexual gratification to a person who has responsibility for the child. And the third type is psychological, and you can also interchange that word with emotional. And that's non-accidental, 
non-accidental verbal or symbolic acts by a caregiver that result or have the potential to result in significant psychological harm to the child, like berating the child, saying you're stupid, I wish you were never born. Parents, yes, do say that to their children, unfortunately. And then again, according to the DSM-5, we have the definition of child neglect, which is any confirmed or suspected egregious act or omission by a child's caregiver that deprives the child of basic age-appropriate needs and thereby results or has the reasonable potential to result in physical or psychological harm for, to the child. So you can have acts of omissions such as abandonment, lack of appropriate supervision, failure to attend to necessary emotional or psychological needs, failure to provide necessary education, medical care, nourishment, shelter, and or clothing. And then when we look at the ACEs study in a moment, it further divides neglect into physical neglect, such as lack of food, clothing, or shelter, and emotional neglect, which is lack of developmentally appropriate supervision or nurturing. And actually severe social neglect is really bad. It can lead to attachment disorders, such as reactive attachment disorder and disinhibited social engagement disorder. Reactive attachment disorders where the child exhibits an inhibited, emotionally withdrawn response to a caregiver just doesn't warm up to people, even a caregiver. Whereas with disinhibited social engagement disorder, is, that's where the child lacks developmentally appropriate wariness towards strangers. So a child who should be a little bit fearful of strangers may go sit in a total stranger's lap and that can be real dangerous. Now, toxic stress has become a popular buzzword um, in pediatrics for the past few years. I never really understood it until I've started really digging in deep. So the toxic stress response is this, a consensus of scientific evidence demonstrates that high doses of cumulative adversity experienced during critical and sensitive periods of early life development without the buffering protections of safe, stable and nurturing relationships and environments can lead to long-term disruptions in brain development immune and hormonal systems and genetic regulatory mechanisms, a condition now known as the toxic stress response. And notice it takes account the dose, the amount of adversity, chronicity over time, and those little brains are still developing. So there are critical and sensitive periods and early life development, the brain is just starting to grow and change so much in early life. So it is real sensitive. And the good news is that we can provide buffering protections for these adversities. Okay, so now that we've defined the toxic stress response, let's define risk factors for toxic stress. And that is a circumstance, exposure, or condition with documented associations with the increased likelihood or susceptibility of development of the toxic stress response. That makes a lot of sense. Um, many of us are familiar with the term social determinants of health, as you can see on the slide here. Let's take a moment to define the social determinants of health and how these additional adversities are risk factors for a toxic stress response. According to the Center for the Developing Child at Harvard University, social determinants of health are conditions of the environments in which people live, learn, work, play, worship, and age that affect a wide range of health functioning and quality of life outcomes and risks. The list of social determinants of health is on the slide here and you can take a look at that. And as you can see, these social determinants of health in and of themselves aren't risk factors. They can be protective or risk factors. 
like having a higher income, you can have access to more services. So that would be protective. And we all know a lower socioeconomic status is a risk factor for the development of a toxic stress response. So here's a slide of the ACEs study. And one of the pieces that's really important to recognize is that the 10 ACEs identified in this landmark study are certainly not the only risk factors for toxic stress. Other factors such as social determinants of health on the previous slide, racial discrimination, separation from a parent due to other things besides divorce or separation, like deportation, or even medical trauma may be a risk factor for toxic stress. And don't forget generational trauma and prenatal adversity can also occur and contribute to the toxic stress response. What is so amazing is that this study was done in a setting where you would expect less adversity and it was done in adults. Childhood experiences contribute to toxic stress response with lasting health effects into adulthood. So the toxic stress response can cause a lot of adversity later on. One of the things that can lead to is symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. The DSM-5 has a nice way of breaking down the risk factors for developing PTSD. They break it down into pre-traumatic, before the trauma, peri-traumatic, and post-traumatic factors. So the pre-traumatic factors include temperamental factors and childhood emotional problems by six years of age is listed there. Pre-traumatically, there's environmental risk factors, lower socioeconomic status, exposure to prior trauma, it builds up, especially childhood trauma, childhood adversity, cultural characteristics, lower intelligence, minority, racial, ethnic status, family psychiatric history. You know what? We just said that's one of the ACEs in the study, right? There's also genetic and psychological risk factors, including the female gender and being younger at the time of the exposure to a traumatic event. Also, certain genotypes may either be protective or increase the risk of PT after exposure to traumatic events. The peritraumatic factors are the factors at the time the trauma occurs. Some of those factors can be environmental, such as severity. And remember the definition of the toxic stress response it depends on the dose, the severity of the trauma, the perceived life threat, personal injury, interpersonal violence, particularly trauma perpetrated by a caregiver or involving a witness threat to a caregiver and children. And when dissociation occurs during the trauma and persists afterwards, that is a risk factor. We'll talk about what dissociation is a little bit later, but basically that's breaking apart the person where, where they are physically and emotionally are disconnected. Then we have post-traumatic factors. They can be temperamental, having negative appraisals, inappropriate coping strategies, and the developmental stage impacts the ability to understand and utilize these coping strategies. And the development of acute stress disorder, which is really PTSD, some PTSD symptoms for less than a month. Then there's environmental factors, subsequent exposure to repeated upsetting reminders, subsequent adverse life events and financial or other trauma-related losses. So remember, we talked about a risk factor for the traumatic stress response as being the chronicity, the amount over time. And also social support. Here's the good news. So including the family for children, but having good social support is a protective factor that moderates the outcome after trauma. So the mechanisms through which ACEs cause physiological responses and toxic stress 
are very important and they're covered in more detail in other presentations in the series. But just to give a brief summary, early maltreatment, including ACEs, may result in an altered response to stressful stimuli mediated by various neurotransmitters and hormones. These lead to changes in neural circuits and brain structure. Yeah, that's right. It changes the size of different parts of the brain. And these are neuroendocrine and neurological responses to toxic stress. And toxic stress also modifies levels of inflammatory markers and the immune response. In an acute life-threatening situation, these responses are adaptive. They help us survive. And some stress is necessary, and it's an essential part of growth and development. Think of the helicopter parent who hovers over their child and protects them from all the little stressors. Those kids can't function once they get older. And toxic stress is the dysregulated biological stress response and related long-term changes in physiology. As mentioned in the previous slide, not all stress responses are toxic. The biological stress response has been characterized as falling into three categories, positive, tolerable, and toxic. The toxic stress response refers to the dysregulated biological stress response and the related long-term changes in physiology. The degree and chronicity of the stress are key components, as is the presence of buffering adult relationships. So on the left, you see the positive stress response. Some stress is a necessary and even essential part of growth and development. It can help us transiently mobilize energy and increase focus to perform better at the task at hand, such as an upcoming test or the big game. The positive stress response is characterized by brief elevations in stress hormones, which affect heart rate and blood pressure in response to routine stressors, like me giving this talk right now. There's also the tolerable stress response. It activates the body's alert system to a greater degree as a result of more severe and longer lasting difficulties, such as the loss of a loved one, a natural disaster, like all these fires we've got going on on the West Coast. If the activation is time limited and buffered by relationships with adults who help the child adapt, the brain and other organs recover from what might otherwise be damaging effects. Response to stress and tolerable stress is buffered by the protections of safe, stable, and nurturing relationships and environments. And toxic stress is defined by the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine as prolonged activation of the stress response systems that can disrupt the development of brain architecture and other organ systems and increase the risk for stress-related disease and cognitive impairment well into the adult years. For children, the result is disruption of the development of brain architecture and other organ systems and an increase in lifelong risk for physical and mental health disorders. So what are some clues to look for to help you detect childhood trauma and the effects of the toxic stress response? In this presentation, we are mostly focusing on ACE-associated health conditions, all the health and behavioral problems that come from this toxic stress response. So when I trained in pediatrics, I was trained to recognize physical abuse, maybe a few cues about how to recognize sexual abuse, but what was I missing? Maybe you've had the same type of training. We need a paradigm shift to recognize other etiologies of adversity. Let's look at clues that trauma should be considered as an etiology of behavior or physical symptoms that you're gonna encounter in your pediatric practices. Also, we need to consider an eco-bio-developmental framework, which has been proposed to look at developmental influences from an interaction of both nature and nurture. 
This is similar to the biopsychosocial conceptualization that I've been trained to use in psychiatry. And it isn't either nature or nurture, it's them dancing together and interacting. Let's learn together about how to detect other adversities besides physical abuse in our patients. So ACEs are risk factors for developing a toxic stress response. We need to begin detecting ACEs and other adversity in our patients we care for. It affects them now and into adulthood. The Pediatric ACEs Related Life Event Screener, otherwise known as PEARLS, is a screening tool that's being used by ACEs Aware for screening. This tool will help us begin to detect ACEs and some other risk factors on the questionnaire associated with the development of the toxic stress response. And we need to recognize other clues of adversity by recognizing the eco-bio-developmental model introduced on the previous slide and recognizing that there are limitations of any screening questionnaire, including PEARLS. When there is an ACE score of zero, or you don't really know what the ACE score is, and you see an ACE-associated health condition, something that could be due to a toxic stress response, the following explanations can be explored. Remember, there can be multiple etiologies of a symptom. It can be due to physiological response, toxic stress, or a combination. So let's take, for example, a headache. That's an ACE-associated health condition. And maybe you're seeing a child in an urgent care, you don't know the ACE score, or the ACE score on the screening was zero. Now, a headache could be from a mechanistic pathway other than toxic stress, like maybe the child's dehydrated, or many other etiologies. And maybe the patient has some other stressors contributing to their health condition. Maybe they're saying, you know what? I don't feel good, mom, I got a headache. I don't wanna go to school. And mom says, okay, you can stay home. Or maybe there really are ACEs that haven't been disclosed for a variety of reasons. So an ACE score of zero may not really be zero. So as mentioned in the previous slide, there can be barriers to di disclosure of ACEs. For example, the caregiver who completed the PEARLS may not be aware of ACEs which occur in other settings. Maybe the child's being treated badly in daycare. And I know of one situation where children were abused by their father when the mother was at work or sleeping. So the mother was clueless as that there was abuse happening to her children until it was disclosed by the children once they became adults and the father was out of the home. Only then did it become safe to disclose what had happened. Also, if the caregiver is traumatizing the child, the caregiver may be afraid to admit what is happening. I mean, Maybe I'm going to be taken to jail, separated from my kids. I don't know what's going to happen. That's pretty scary. Or they may not even see it as trauma. Okay, that's how I was raised. I'm fine. There's nothing wrong with it. I saw that a lot when I was training in Georgia. And there's also another factor that comes into play with disclosing very personal and private in information, and that's the intimacy barrier concept that Judy will present in the next slide. Okay, this slide was already introduced in the developmental and relational paradigm presentation, but we have some things to add, so we wanted to include it here also. Uh, Dr. Bruce Perry created this graph to visually represent what he has identified as the intimacy barrier. When I first learned about this intimacy barrier, I just found it so obvious in terms of what was happening with the children that I was working with. We need to remember that the y-axis measures the past relational interactions and the x-axis measures the level of current ability to experience intimate relationships with others. 
the quality of positive relationships in the past influence the potential closeness and trust that the child can experience with others in the present. Current interpersonal relationships can be significantly affected as trauma survivors may struggle to trust others. Trauma itself can cause a barrier in the disclosure of the trauma to others. Retraumatization in the mental health system can prevent good outcomes from being achieved. Asking about a trauma can bring back vivid memories of the trauma and can impair the therapeutic relationship. It is best to wait for the child to volunteer what information she feels safe in sharing. Therefore, we want to avoid re-traumatization when screening for ACEs. I've learned to change my approach um, with the youth I see in a residential environment with high degrees of trauma. So when I meet a new youth, if she is shy, I don't push for eye contact because sometimes eye contact could be considered threatening when you have a history of trauma. And I will speak vaguely about trauma responses and ask, can you relate to that? And sometimes the youth will say, I don't want to talk about it. And I respect that and tell her, okay, I won't ask about that anymore today and I'll move on. I also watch her body language to tell me she's not present. In fact, one time I had a child with her head down and just wasn't even listening or engaging. So I said, you know what? It looks like you're really struggling. Why don't we reschedule this appointment for another time where it might be easier for you? And I sometimes tell kids, I have to ask a lot of questions. Sometimes it gets tough. Let me know if you need to take a break or I'll have slime or some other fidget available for them to play with. And sometimes I, I really had to learn to be creative, but I'll use other forms of communication. Not all communication is spoken. Sometimes youth will write down the answers of questions for me. And sometimes they complete questionnaires more accurately than they'll tell me things too. So I've modified my interviews in the residential setting to avoid asking really sensitive questions which could re-traumatize the youth. And I like what Dr. Perry explains as fishing therapy where you're just kind of sitting with the youth, developing a rapport with them, waiting for them to feel comfortable with you. And sometimes as the youth become more comfortable with me, I'm amazed at what comes out of their mouth and what they begin to share once they start to feel safe. And this also gives the youth a sense of having control, which they so desperately need. So pearl screening, or an ACE score alone, doesn't address protective factors. And so protective factors have been added to what they now call the triad of ACE screening. Relational factors can moderate the impact of childhood adversity. In fact, poor relational interactions are an ACE. Healthy, nurturing, supportive relationships are one of the key protective factors which modifies the toxic stress response and builds resilience and improves outcomes. In fact, central to the notion of positive stress, the availability of a caring and responsive adult and the definition of toxic stress states that it occurs in the absence of the buffering capacity of a caregiver. And this was covered in more detail in the previous presentation on developmental and relational paradigm. As you can see in this diagram, the response to early life adversity can be modified by protective factors and predisposing factors. In particular, the absence of protective factors, it can alter the biological stress response, disrupt the development of the neuroendocrine, immune, metabolic, and genetic regulatory mechanisms, and lead to a toxic stress response, thus increasing the risk for health problems, physical and mental or behavioral. And don't forget that toxic stress impacts gene expression too. So ACE screening involves assessing for a triad of factors related to the toxic stress response. 
using the triad approach for universal screening for clinical toxic stress in primary care, which includes assessing for an ACE score for cumulative adversity, clinical manifestations of toxic stress in the form of ACE-associated health conditions, and protective factors. Individuals with risk factors and or early signs of toxic stress can be targeted for early intervention, and we can build on buffering protective factors. Dr. Bruce Perry has created a metric to address the impact of adverse experiences and relational health in a context of developmental risk, and Judy will talk about that on the next slide. Looking at the developmental history and risk, we need to take into account the child's developmental history of adverse experiences and relational support and their developmental stages to understand the developmental risk and how the child could respond to toxic stress. There are sensitive periods of development when the child is particularly responsive to an environmental stimulus. The graph on the left shows a neurosequential model of therapeutics metric. This was developed by Dr. Bruce Perry, and it assesses both adverse experiences in the red and relational health in the green during different developmental stages. This child has experienced multiple adverse experiences with minimal exposure to buffering relational health experiences until recently. This is the definition of toxic stress. There is prolonged activation of the stress response system without the buffering protection of safe, stable, and nurturing relationships. On the right, we see a developmental risk graph using the MMT metric derived from the graph on the left. Subtracting the relational health from the adverse experiences, the developmental risk for each developmental stage can be calculated. Up through early childhood, this child is in the high risk developmental risk zone, which is toxic stress. In the high risk zone, meaningful treatment can't occur due to the ongoing adversity without adequate relational buffering. Safety is needed to recover from trauma. In the moderate risk zone, which is the yellow zone, the stress response is more tolerable as the adverse experiences decrease and the buffering relational health begins to improve. In the low risk zone, the green zone, the stress response is lowered when a decrease in the adverse experiences and the increase in the presence of a caring and responsive adult. This is where significant progress can be made in the healing process. We can loosely consider high risk as being similar to toxic stress, moderate risk to tolerable stress, and low risk to positive stress. Research has shown us that relational health can buffer stress and reduce, or in some cases, eliminate the negative health impacts associated with ACE. If ACE and toxic stress can increase risks for poor health in one generation, promoting relational health will decrease ACEs and toxic stress in the next. So that gives us some hope. Now let's look at when trauma occurs from a developmental perspective, and that was addressed in those metrics we just saw by breaking the adversity and protective factors into different developmental stages. And this talk of topic was covered in more detail in developmental and relational paradigm presentation earlier. So lack of understanding of the effects of early, especially preverbal, childhood trauma can cause misunderstanding of behaviors or physical symptoms in a child, which may result in us missing an opportunity to detect childhood trauma. Sometimes we don't even know what children experienced before they were able to use words. It is by their responses to triggers that we know something bad must have happened. 
children who have experienced ACEs can present with behaviors more typical of a much younger child or less commonly of an older child. And remember, the definition of toxic stress addresses adversity during critical and sensitive periods of early life development. So early adversity can occur any time during a child's development, even before birth. And that's something I tended to forget. Understanding when adversity occurred can help us understand the context of symptoms. In general, the earlier the adversity occurred, the greater the impact, as the brain has not developed means to process the trauma. And trauma itself also impairs further brain development. And let's not forget that generational trauma and prenatal trauma exist, especially prenatal alcohol exposure. My daughter, whom I adopted, has been in care and in my home since her birth. She was impacted by generational trauma and then prenatal trauma via substance exposure and domestic violence in her birth mother. This has really hit home personally for me. That's why I'm so passionate about this. And some of these ideas were covered in more detail in developmental and relational paradigm talk. So when available, family history and family trauma history should be obtained. Family history of trauma is important to understand the generational transmission of adversity associated with epigenetics, which is an alteration in how the genes are expressed. There are also pre-traumatic genetic factors predisposing to the development of PTSD and some of those are protective also. And how the parents were parented and their childhood impacts how parents will in turn parent their own children. People tend to parent the way that they were parented since that is what was modeled for them. If a child's mother was raised in the foster care system or had a traumatic childhood, that is a bright red flag. I've worked treating a youth whose parents and grandparents were raised in foster care. Even though the child was placed in a loving, nurturing environment, the child continued to exhibit dysregulated behavior, which placed the family members at risk of physical aggression. And that led to the poor child being placed in a residential facility where I worked. Prenatally, maternal stress influences the fetus and later responsiveness to stress. And prenatal exposures to substances, malnutrition, and maternal stressors are adverse experiences. And did you know that alcohol is the most common cause of preventable intellectual disability? And as I mentioned earlier, I adopted my daughter at birth and she later developed behavioral problems. I discovered that my daughter's birth mother had used alcohol during pregnancy. She was also in an abusive relationship. This prenatal adversity affected her, even though I raised her from birth. This is a slide created by Dr. Bruce Perry, and it shows how the brain develops from the bottom up. It also includes what basic functions generally develop in various parts of the brain. Early responses come from the lower brain, the brainstem, without mediation from the higher levels of the brain, which are not developed prenatally or until the person is much older. Note how sleep and appetite, satiety, are located lower in the brain along with heart rate and temperature regulations. We don't even think about these functions. Further up the brain, arousal, motor regulation, emotional reactivity develop, and finally, affirmation and executive functioning. Trauma during early development is especially damaging since the higher levels of the brain aren't developed enough to process the trauma. Early childhood trauma affects brain structure and increases the size of the amygdala and decreases the size of the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex. 
These changes in brain structure and function mediate some of the behavioral manifestations seen in children who have experienced adversity. The brain pathways are also use dependent. If the child does not have healthy co-regulating caregivers, healthy brain pathways do not develop to deal effectively with stressors. Then reactions to stimuli are more reflexive from the survival mode in the lower parts of the brain rather than utilizing the higher parts of the brain functioning. These concerns have also been discussed in the presentation in the developmental and relational paradigm. So where I work at a residential facility, there was a youth who just would sit and rock herself back and forth. The staff were wondering what's wrong with her and were asking, why is she doing that? Well, she experienced early childhood neglect. That was her way to self-soothe, which is a lower brain response to deal with stress. Regressive behaviors are common in children who are exposed to early trauma, sometimes thumb sucking is too. And also sleep is a lower brain function and that's often dysregulated in many youth with histories of trauma for a variety of reasons. Now that we understand that the developmental stage when trauma occurred and protective relational experiences influence the presentation of trauma, Let's learn to recognize some behavioral or physical presentations of trauma, otherwise known as ACEs associated health conditions. And this could indicate that maybe the child's experiencing a toxic stress response and we can help. I think that we all know this, but sometimes it helps to be reminded. Physical and mental experiences are interrelated. For example, mental health symptoms can be manifested as physical symptoms. In fact, in the DSM-5, there's even a diagnosis for psychological conditions affecting other medical conditions. So in this example, feeling anxious can be manifested as abdominal pain. Likewise, the physical symptoms can lead to mental health symptoms. Feeling ill physically can cause worry and anxiety or depression. At the same time, trauma can cause a toxic stress response, which can cause ACE-associated health conditions in both mental and physical health domains. In fact, in my pediatric practice, I cared for a school-age girl and she came in with abdominal pain with their mom and it happened that the abdominal pain occurred on school mornings. So I was concerned about school anxiety. Uh, I suggested to mom, you know what? Feeling this ill has to be bothering her. Why don't you take her for counseling because it can help while we're working up the cause of the GI pain. So we did a full GI workup, which was negative, and then the mom finally sought counseling for her daughter, and the abdominal pain resolved with psychotherapy, and no psychotropic medications were needed. So we don't want to miss an opportunity to detect childhood trauma because we didn't consider the toxic stress response when the parent brought the child to see us with the behavioral complaint. And remember that a toxic stress response occurs when there is chronic exposure to adversity without protective buffering factors, which can affect the nervous system and neuroendocrine system, which can result in behavioral manifestations of trauma. Notice what this child is communicating without using words. There is so much more to communication than words. Young children use body language and behavior to communicate. Maltreated children are far more often identified as problem children than are their peers. Approach the child's body language and behavior with curiosity about what the child is communicating rather than judging the child as being a bad child. Try to understand the context of the behavior through a developmental lens with curiosity. 
So we've been trained to create a differential diagnosis when addressing physical complaints since early in our training, because we need to treat the underlying etiology of the symptom. When a parent br brings their child to us with a cough, we don't just say, oh, here's a cough suppressant, it'll go away. We look at what's causing the cough and we treat the cause of the cough. If we treat a cough due to a cold with a cough suppressant, they don't cough that phlegm up, it can go down into the lungs and cause pneumonia. So we can use the same approach for addressing behavioral symptoms in addition to the physical symptoms with ACE associated health conditions. So when a patient presents with anxiety, depression, poorly controlled asthma, one of the ACE associated health conditions, put toxic stress on your differential diagnosis list. Just like you treat a cough from pneumonia differently than a cough due to allergies, you'll need to use additional management considerations to address the toxic stress physiology if that is part of what is happening. For example, you see a patient that's having poorly controlled asthma due to toxic stress physiology. In addition to routine asthma care, you need to consider ways to address any current stressors in the household. Provide interventions to regulate the stress response system. And consider that the toxic stress may be causing a decreased responsiveness to albuterol and steroid medications because you still need to do both. And using a medical approach to create a differential diagnosis, don't forget the basics for any physical or behavioral presentation. In the above ex cough example, cough and toxic stress can both cause insomnia. If kids don't sleep well, they don't do well. Remember our training, all those sleepless nights? I don't think we were at our best then. So let's keep in touch with these other factors that can influence how a child is doing physically and behaviorally. You can even consider making a space on your current visit or subsequent visits to discuss some of the evidence of toxic stress response and what the parent can do so they feel like they can do something. So let's apply this approach to a behavioral complaint and attention. We see children in our practices all the time where parents say, my child just can't focus, help me. Now in this example, there can be many reasons for a child to be inattentive. It could be related to the environment, such as ACEs or other stressors. Inattention is also a symptom of many behavioral or mental health diagnoses. And physical conditions can also result in attention. In fact, I once had a patient who came in with some behavioral changes and inattention who turned out to have leukemia. Now, when, when have you recently had a stressful experience? Has it affected your concentration? Now imagine that experience happening over and over again when you were much younger, like two or three years old. Wow. And don't many people jump to the diagnosis of ADHD when they hear attention? I've had schools send me patients and say, prescribe stimulants, this kid's got ADHD. However, the treatment for ADHD is typically a stimulant and stimulant medication could actually exacerbate toxic stress or anxiety if that's what's causing the symptoms. Whereas treatment with an alpha agonist, such as guanfacine or clonidine, may, may be more helpful in those cases of inattention mediated by toxic stress. So let's look at some other behavioral presentations of trauma besides inattention. There is a huge list, as you can see, of psychiatric diagnoses which have symptoms which overlap with trauma symptoms. And some diagnoses like PTSD or acute distress disorder include trauma in their definition. And my frustration dealing with the DSM-5 is that sometimes childhood trauma presents differently than what I see in the DSM 
So sometimes I will use trauma and stressor related disorder to indicate that the child's problems are due to trauma and stress rather than another etiology. And there's the developmental trauma disorder. It's not in the DSM-5, but um, others are being proactive to have that added because it better describes the experience that children have when they're exposed to maltreatment. And many kids that I see coming into a residential facility have this alphabet soup diagnosis. They have probably five, six of those diagnoses on the list, like depression and bipolar disorder. You have one or the other. So understanding the trauma etiology can help you narrow down your diagnoses. So these slides, think of the big picture. There's a lot of information here. And they give you examples of behavioral symptoms of trauma in the left column. The center column has a description of what you might see. And the far right column are listed mental health diagnoses, which include that same trauma symptom. So you can understand why there's so much confusion. And these tables are in the handout for your future reference. So um, looking at this table here, if you see a child with language delay, along with self-soothing, repetitive behaviors, sensory issues, poor eye contact, and related to trauma, sometimes it can be misattributed to autism spectrum disorder. In fact, I recently attended an AAP conference and one of the presenters said not to diagnose autism or ADHD in kids with trauma until you fully assess for the trauma. Also, a big problem I see is youth with histories of trauma have emotional lability, sleep disturbances, and irritability, and they're misdiagnosed as bipolar disorder and put on medications which don't help. Again, here's another slide with the same information. Aggression is a common symptom I see in the population I work with. Being on the edge, hypervigilance, they can't sit still due to their toxic stress response. They have activation of the sympathetic nervous system in response to a perceived threat. No, it may not be a real threat, but to them, they see something. It reminds them of trauma and they react impulsively without taking time to think. Their amygdala is larger. They haven't developed their prefrontal cortex. They perceive a threat, so their arousal state is high, remembering state-dependent function in the previous lecture, and they don't think about future, they're in their survival mode. They haven't had the buffering protection of safe relationships, they learn to pause and try to use different pathways in their brain to think about what's, what's happening. This is the toxic stress response, and it probably was protective when they weren't safe. They needed to protect themselves because no one else did. And now they need nurturing, buffering relationships in an emotionally and physically safe environment to rewire the brain and reduce their arousal level. They don't need incarceration. And simply speaking, there are two ways people sometimes respond to trauma or even reminders of trauma, which could be in the ACEs screening. Sometimes they can shut down and withdraw with decreased arousal. They don't respond to anything around them. They're shut down, detached from the outside world. The outside world is too scary. So they just sit there and stare and don't respond. Or the other thing that can happen, they not only remember the bad experience, it's worse than watching it on a movie screen, but they re-experience it in their own mind. They hear the sounds around them and the yelling and the screaming and the hitting, they feel those blows. Imagine what that's like. And sometimes that's misdiagnosed as psychosis. Yes, they're out of touch with reality, but it's not a psychotic disorder, it's traumatic re-experiencing. 
So we've just covered a long list of behavioral symptoms of trauma. Now let's take a look at physical manifestations of trauma which occur via the toxic stress reaction via other pathways. And of course there's a low overlap. Some behavioral and physical manifestations go together. Here is a list of some of the ACE-associated health conditions mediated by the toxic stress response. Now, this is a list, and it's not a complete list. There's other symptoms that aren't even on here. When you've been stressed out, have you had nausea, vomiting, diarrhea? So keep an open mind to other things, and we'll cover a few in the next few slides. So this is something that I hadn't even thought about going into detail on some of the physical symptoms associated with trauma. Seizure disorders can be associated with adversity. Children with three or more ACEs have increased odds of epilepsy or seizure disorder. And for some patients with epilepsy, stress can precipitate a seizure. And electogenesis is a multi-stage process that can begin early in life, and it may be negatively influenced by stress. Now we touched a little bit on dissociative states, and those can occur in trauma and stressor-related disorder, or there are actually dissociative disorders in the DSM-5. A dissociative disorder is disruption, of and or discontinuity in the normal integration of your consciousness, memory, identity, emotion, perception, body representation, motor control, and behavior. A relationship between dissociative disorders and childhood trauma has been described in epidemiological studies. In fact, seizure disorders are included in the differential diagnosis of dissociative disorders. And a fixed or glazed eyes during a dissociative episode, remember when I said they can turn inside and tune everything out? It can look like a staring spell, which is an absent seizure. So you need to consider both. One of the youth I care for had trauma prior to one year of age fight flight wasn't an option for him. So he would go into staring spells and mom would describe these to me. And he had a workup and his EEG was negative. So once I started learning more about trauma and the effects, I realized he was having dissociative episodes. So then we approach it totally different without the medication. The stress response to trauma can sometimes look like a seizure. Psychogenic non-epileptic seizures are not true seizures. They are a type of a somatic symptom disorder, more specifically a type of functional neurological symptom disorder. The former term for that was conversion disorder. The term pseudo-seizure has fallen out of favor as it is implied that the seizure was intentional and faked. It is not an intentional response on the part of the patient. Onset may be associated with a stress or trauma with recurrences associated with stressors. It's seen mostly in psychiatry, neurology, and emergency departments, but as pediatricians, you may see them for follow-up visits. Like dissociation, it is a means to escape and overwhelming experiences. And these are really scary for the family and the youth as they resemble the seizure without corresponding brain activity on the EEG. Now, one thing that's typically different is there's usually no incontinence or postictal state, and they don't tend to bite their tongue or injure themselves during the seizure. And their eyes are typically closed shut and you can't open them, whereas sometimes there's changes in gaze and eye movement you'll notice during seizures. And there is serious morbidity due to the delay in appropriate treatment. They can be harmed by anti-epileptic medications, cause weight gain and all kinds of side effects, which don't help anyway. 
They are diagnosed by video EEG and the treatment is psychotherapy. Now, sometimes inadequate nurturing can somehow result in failure to grow, even when provided with caloric intake that's adequate. There's a book called The Boy Who Was Raised as a Dog by Dr. Bruce Perry, and I highly recommend it if you haven't read it yet. And in that book, there's a chapter titled Skin Hunger, where the mother grew up in foster care. She didn't know how to be nurturing to her child because she wasn't nurtured. Yes, she was able to feed her daughter, but her daughter had unmet emotional connections. The child needed that. This emotional neglect led to failure to thrive. It was medically worked up, but they didn't consider the loss of that emotional attachment. Studies have associated emotional deprivation with poor growth related to the toxic stress response, which can cause hypopituitarism. So non-suicidal self-injurious behavior has become more common during a patient encounter, you may notice superficial abrasions or lacerations on the skin. Consider physical abuse versus self-injurious behavior. Ask about the lesions in a non-judgmental manner while developing a therapeutic alliance based upon acceptance and validation strategies. And by validation, I don't mean validate, hey, it's okay to hurt yourself, but when they hurt themselves, they are in a lot of emotional distress. Validate the emotions behind the behavior, not the behavior. And very rarely is this actually a suicide attempt. Yet you need to check and make sure it's not. Don't be afraid to ask about it. And if you do ask about suicide, suicidality, there are validated tools you can use, which are referenced at the end. Strong associations exist between ACEs and many of the leading causes of death in the U.S. In those with four or more ACEs, the risk of suicide attempt is 37 and a half times those with zero ACEs. And that's in a, that adult study. Youth with a history of child adversity or at higher risk for suicidality. Screening and assessment tools for suicidality are available and included with the resources associated with this talk. Asking about suicidality doesn't mean they're gonna go and attempt suicide just because you talked about it. And if you don't ask, you can't help them. In summary, Childhood trauma can present with physical and behavioral symptoms via the toxic stress response, which impact various systems in our body. So remember to keep trauma and the resultant toxic stress response in your differential diagnosis. Don't be afraid to recognize adversity because it's treatable. And as Dr. Heather Forkey said in her recent presentation, it's not about summing the suffering, but about building the buffering. Thank you. Thank you to Danielle and Judith for that really informative presentation. Myself, I'm a I'm a behaviorist, and so I'm fascinated by the idea of looking at behaviors as not just stemming from, you know, organic uh, reasons, but also looking at trauma. So I'm fascinated by that. Hopefully all of you were um, really fascinated by it as well. Before we get into our Q&A portion, I wanted to take a few moments to remind you about uh, ACEs training, certification, and screening. The so clinical team members who bill Medi-Cal must complete a certified ACEs Aware core training and attest to completing the training to qualify to receive Medi-Cal payment for conducting ACE screenings. And in terms of the Becoming ACEs Aware in California training, there is a free two-hour online training that certifies eligible clinicians to receive Medi-Cal payment for ACE screenings. Uh, clinicians and clinical team members will receive two continuing medical education credits and two maintenance of certification or MOC credits upon completion, and of course encouraged to join the ACE Aware Clinician Directory. So we will now start the Q&A portion of the presentation in our lecture series. 
You are encouraged to submit your questions via the chat box or raise your hand using the raise your hand function, which is on the bottom of your screen. If you click on reactions, there is an, a, an option to raise your hand if you have a question. And again, of course, you can continue to type any questions that you may have. So let's get started. I see one question. Let's see here. There it is. I see some comments. So thank you for those comments in the chat. Just I'll read one of the comments. Excellent presentation. Thank you for the complete picture of all of the information on this subject. You covered it very well for clinicians, parents, and children to better understand toxic stress and trauma conditions. Clearly, developmental trauma disorder needs to be in the next DSM. Nurturing, buffering relations, not incarceration. Yes, exclamation point, I agreed. Wonderful, thank you for that. Um, and we do have a question here in terms of, in your opinion and in your practice, if a child has already been diagnosed without considering a traumatic etiology and therefore misdiagnosed with a trauma imposter, do you immediately rescind the former diagnosis or do you attempt to treat for both diagnoses and or can treating for both be beneficial? Actually, that's an excellent question. Thank you for that, especially considering what I dealt with in a residential setting. You do need to consider that uh, toxic stress can be part of the etiology, but also toxic stress does increase the likelihood of developing depressive disorders and other mental health disorders. So they can have one or both. Um, I saw many patients who came to me with diagnoses of um, bipolar disorder. And there was one I actually tried a um, SSRI on who went into a manic episode. That was very rare. And it's, I really had to work with the team because I could treat the bipolar disorder with medication and the trauma part need to be treated differently. She hoarded food, had really severe reactions to food or not getting what she needed right away due to her trauma. So you really need to dig down deep and you don't get answers as to whether it's one diagnosis or two, but if there is more than one diagnosis, if there's comorbidities, you need to treat them all with appropriate evidence-based interventions. Thank you for that. I think it speaks to what you said. You have to really dig deep and look for some of these, like the toxic stress response as well, in addition to other uh, pieces. Okay. Another one came in. A reminder, you can, of course, put them into the chat. I've got a few that came to me or use your uh, raise your hand function. I'm particularly interested in this one because I have a history working with kids with autism. So the question is, do children who meet the criteria for developmental trauma disorder, as well as another separate diagnosis, such as autism, always require separate services, do you focus your treatment and the child services on one diagnosis or the other? So similar to the last question, and if so, why? Yes, you do need to treat both diagnoses if they're both there. And as I said before, you've got to make sure it is truly autism spectrum disorder and the symptoms aren't due to the trauma because some of these youth are very slow to warm up, don't make eye contact, do repetitive behaviors. And for autism, you use ABA therapy, applied behavioral analysis. And sometimes that can be really helpful in the use of trauma disorders because you need to look at the antecedents to what triggers the child. Like one of the youth I had been seeing who was diagnosed with bipolar disorder had been abused with a, something to do with a high pressure hose. Now he was too young to recall what had happened, but he had an aversion to bathing due to that. Thankfully, the caregiver was aware of that. The traumas, you know, we may not know, but we need to look at, okay, what are the antecedents? Okay, in this case, water aversion was an antecedent to behavioral problems. And sometimes, like in the case of the fetal alcohol spectrum disorder too, sometimes it's easier to adjust the environment and control the antecedent rather than reinforcing the behavior. 
sometimes that's not as effective, but I think you need to take whatever treatment is recommended and utilize that. And we know in therapy, effective therapy requires a rapport with the patient and their family to be effective. You can use a tool, CBT, DBT real well, but if they're not on board with you, it's not gonna be effective either. Thank you for mentioning that, Danielle, because I'm right there in terms of understanding that in all therapies, we have to focus on the relationship because the relationship is going to make that difference regardless of what we try to, how we try to work with our clients. So um, keeping relationship in the forefront is always important. And then again, a big point is if there's safety issues involved, you always have to treat those first. If you don't have a, pa if a patient commits suicide or harms themselves severely, you can't work on the other issues. So safety is very important to address first. And then you go down the list, okay, what's impairing function the most and go down the list and work on mostly one thing at a time if you can. Those are some excellent points. Um, I think we have time for one more question. So if you have any burning questions or thoughts, here's your chance. You can again put in the chat or raise your hand. Okay, I got here a direct one sent to me. Let's see. Can you elaborate on some of the ways therapy and support services are different for patients with a developmental trauma disorder versus a mental health diagnosis? I think in some ways they're very similar as we just talked about with the trauma or mental health diagnosis, it requires psychoeducation. And I think that's a key component for either. I find when I do psychoeducation, that's when the patients start to join with me and understand and feel safer. And there's a lot of shame involved with trauma and there can be with the other mental health diagnoses too. So developing that rapport, providing psychoeducation and actually in both too, I try to look at with the patient, what is bothering them, get to know them. What are their goals? What do they want? And then join with them in that and seek to treat the symptoms that are getting in the way of reaching their goals. And then they're willing to work with you. One of my psychotherapy mentors used to say, you can give someone the best directions for how to get to Cleveland. And they, you can get them right where, you know, downtown Cleveland. But if they want to go to New York, it's worthless. So it's really important to find out what the patients want. Like if I'm dealing with a psychotic patient, I'm not going to say, I'm going to give you medicines to get rid of your psychosis, but gosh, you were just telling me that you saw someone with pointing a gun at you from that car. That's got to be scary. What if I can give you some medication so that you won't have that experience? I know how miserable that is for you. And that patient just came right along and was very cooperative in the process. So you have to really understand what the patient's goals are and work together. We also need to remember that brain, the brain controls all behavior and all functions. And so we wanna make sure that we're dealing with what's going on with the brain so that we can help our patients and meet them at the point of where we can be effective with them. I have a question. Yes, Dr. Diemer, go ahead. <laughs> First of all, congratulations. I thought this was an excellent uh, presentation and uh, both women just had so much to share with the rest of us. But uh, I have a question for Dr. Shaw in particular. Have you found that uh, kids in group situations who have been traumatized uh, benefit uh, that much from small group situations where they share the kind of trauma that they've gone through? In other words, to what extent does this kind of group uh, interaction uh, benefit kids that are trying to work their ways through these kinds of traumatic experiences? Yeah, that's a really good question because it depends on where the youth are in their trauma trajectory. If they're at a point where there's a lot of 
aggression, they're highly on edge and hypervigilant, they can't focus to really engage and get anything out of the group. So sometimes groups aren't very helpful. And sometimes there are youth who haven't had any work up for testing done. And sometimes we'll find that there's some developmental delay and maybe they're not even cognitively able to participate in groups and understand. And sometimes they can be disruptive. And then that it, in groups, if you have someone who's disruptive, it really ruins the flow of the group and ruins it for everyone. So I think if you have a group where they're getting to the point they're willing to open up, and as we mentioned earlier, there's an issue of trauma impairs the ability to have a more intimate relationship with someone. You've got that intimacy barrier. So if you've got a disruptive group, they're not going to feel safe opening up and sharing what they're experiencing, where they could really actually bond over that. And I would add that it's, it's really important to know the people, the participants, before you actually put them in a group for all the reasons that Dr. Dr. Shaw just said, so that you can have a cohesive group that actually can benefit. And as we know, one of the benefits of group uh, psychotherapy is normalizing the experience. When you have a, a loving, supportive, nurturing environment that... Uh... I think we can say is characteristic of Casa Pacifica. Uh, what sort of length of stay uh, do you anticipate? Does it depend on the type of trauma perhaps that these kids have gone through? Does it depend on developmental factors that uh, we talked about uh, in considerable detail this evening? Uh, in other words, what, what, uh, what determines length of stay at Casa Pacifica? Well, there they've got a step system, but overall looking at attachment issues, those that have more difficulty attaching to people and engaging in the program don't tend to do as well. Uh, okay. Those, because there are some that will never come to an appointment with me and it's really hard to get them to attend. I've had to be creative and make slime with them. In fact, the other day, they saw me making slime with one of their peers. It's like, oh, can we do that next time we meet? It's like, oh, they didn't even want to see me before. I'm making progress. So I've just learned to be real creative to meet them where they are to, so they'll come. But some of them just have such a hard time attaching to anyone and those just don't do well and they probably really need to be in a smaller environment. Okay. One Thank more question. You. One oh, more question. One more. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> when I first arrived here in Ventura in uh, 1974, I would say within two or three years, I uh, participated in the founding of the local chapter of Child Abuse and Neglect, CAN. Uh, have, have you found that that con continues to be a helpful resource for uh, kids and, uh, uh, and parents that are involved in this sort of uh, trauma thing that we've been talking about this evening? <clears throat> Actually, I'm not aware of CAN. I don't know if you are, Sharon, or if Imani or someone else could answer that. I'm not familiar with it either. Okay. I was here in 1974, and I remember CAN, but I'm not aware that it's still functioning. Uh-huh. Okay. But it was one of but it was one of the first things that brought this county's awareness to yeah. that there are children out there and we need to do something. Yeah. And so it was a wonderful start in this county. Okay. Thank you. And I, I was gonna say it probably has evolved into many other things. So like Judith just said, you know, it, it's a starting point for people to recognize that this is an area that we have to be focusing on supporting children. And we're very lucky. I mean, there's still a lot of work to be done, but there's there's different networks. There's, I mean, obviously looking at ACEs Aware just statewide, right? That we have this now is pretty amazing. 
So I, I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. There were some really great questions. Thank you, Dr. Deemer, for those great questions. So hopefully you're feeling a little bit more equipped to look at toxic stress and keeping that in the back of your heads, along with trauma, when you're looking at differential diagnosis and screening for ACEs, your patients and your clients. Thank you to our speakers. This is their second lecture, and we really appreciate your time and your expertise. There will be some important reminders from the Landon Pediatric Foundation ACEs Grant Coordinators, so stay tuned and have a great night. Thank you again for watching this lecture. Remember to complete the registration and evaluation. We will contact you soon if you are one of our raffle winners, so stay tuned. Make sure to follow us on all our social media accounts and subscribe on our webpage for more information of our 12 lecture series, ACES Aware Ventura County, and all things ACES Aware. Thank you for joining us on our mission to bring better help, better health, and better hope to Ventura County and beyond. Bye, Bye. see you at our next session. And just a final thank you again for everyone who was took some time out of their Friday evening to join this session. We appreciate it. And thank you again to Danielle and Judy for this informative presentation. And thank you to Sharon for moderating the session. Um, and we hope to see you at our future sessions. We've got uh, four more in the series. So you can visit our website to register. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us via our website or our email. So thank you and happy Friday.